Neil deGrasse Tyson is in the house. And when now I've known Dr. Tyson for decades, his new book, Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Future, is quite different from his other books. In this one, he appears to be a man on a space mission trying to reinvigorate our manned space program for many of the same reasons we professed back in the space race of the 60s, though he says that's not what inspired him. There's no space race today, you say? Neil disagrees. He says space exploration is about kicking the U.S. back into gear into a nation that innovates, that advances the frontiers of science and technology. It's about turning our country back into a visionary country, a country that dreams. Do you agree? Why do we need people in space when robots like the rovers on Mars seem to be collecting a lot of useful information? If you'd like to talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, our number is 1-800-989-8255, 1-800-989-TALK. You can also uh, tweet us a question at SciFry at S-C-I-F-R-I and go to our website at sciencefriday.com where we actually have a desktop diary of Neil Tyson that we'll be talking about later. He's the author of Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier, and the uh, he's an astrophysicist, of course, at the American Museum of Natural History here in New York. Welcome back to Science Friday. Thanks, Ari. Good to be back. Tell us about, you know, you seem to be, on, as I say, on a mission here. Am I mischaracterizing that? Well, it, uh, you know, most missions are people's personal crusades to try to change the world so that it matches their point of view. And I don't think of it that way. I think of it as me trying to alert America of what it did well in the past and just trying to sort of resurrect some of those habits and behaviors going forward for the benefit of all. So I don't feel this as a personal mission as one, as, as much as I feel it as a just an attempt for everyone to sort of uh, re-establish our sense of what our future needs to be. But you think that time is of the essence here? Well, yeah. I mean, we're, we're fading. We're sliding. We're, you look at all the symptoms in society today. We're losing jobs. The, the economy is tanking. We, we don't have many science. The, the, the interest in science is on an ebb. Our performance of our students is at all-time lows on an, an international scale. And what tends to happen is, you know, when you're a politician or just anybody, you, you say, oh, we need more scientists. And you say, well, I know the solution. Let's have better science teachers. And so you put out, you allocate some money, it makes a good headline, it makes a good sound bite, and you think you're actually solving the problem that way, when in fact, that's just an open sore, and you're putting a Band-Aid on it without any awareness of the underlying condition that's creating that, uh, those symptoms. And you think the underlying, underlying condition is that we don't have some unified... Well, like the space race we had in the 60s. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, t- yes, it was a space race, but what specifically mattered about the space race is that every day we were reaching farther than we had the day before. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, either literally or metaphorically, you have to invent something. You have to innovate because you're about to do what has never been done before. That practically, by definition, is innovation. And the space program became, became proxy for anyone's effort to try to create a new kind of tomorrow compared with the today they were living in. And take, for example, the World's Fair, the New York World's Fair. Uh, You can say to yourself today, oh, I know, let's have another World's Fair and remind people what the future can be like. No, no, that's, that's the cart ahead of the horse. The World's Fair emerged from a culture that was dreaming about tomorrow. And mm-hmm. so that's, that's, a, that's an expression of a state of mind that already pervaded society. And it, and it further stoked it, of course, and it fanned the flames. And, so, and it got a whole new generation engaged as well. But all I'm saying is today you don't see any of that. No one is thinking about tomorrow. Nobody is dreaming. No, we're only thinking about surviving right. the day. Well, it's because tomorrow in this day and age has become very expensive. <laughs> well, you know, if you want to talk money, yeah, people let's say talk money. we can't really afford to go into space. That's if you think space is a handout. Yeah, if it's a handout, then no, we we can't afford it. We got plenty of other things we need to do. However, apart from the spin-offs, which we can we should spend some time on uh, alerting mm-hmm. people if they didn't know what some of the direct and indirect spin-offs are of space technology, that's not even the strongest argument to do it. You could also cite the glory of discovery and scientific advance, and that's uh, that's my lead reason personally, but that's still not even the most compelling reason to do it. The most compelling reason to do it is we are l- we are fading fast on the world stage of economic strength. Something is a very uncomfortable position for us to be in because we, we're unfamiliar 
lagging in that category. We can lag in other categories, you know, with, you know, do we have as much opera as Europe? I, you know, I don't know. But if you're lagging in your strength of your economy in this, the modern world, you can ask, what does it take to stoke the economy? And everybody who embraces innovations in science and technology since the Industrial Revolution has led the world in the strength of their economy, and that's what we're lagging in right now. And you think going back into space will spur the economy that way? Yes, yes. It spurs it because it will first spur the economy directly. You can think of our presence in space and the F provided, by the way, we are advancing a space frontier, mm -hmm. all right? None of this, let's spend 30 years boldly going where hundreds have gone before in low Earth orbit. That was the, essentially the, the, the legacy of the space shuttle is primarily the space station. An engineering frontier for sure. That was an amazing piece of hardware up there, the, the size of a football field, uh, assembled in zero G by astronauts uh, and and others who, who who traveled there by space station and Soyuz. So n no doubt about that. But nonetheless, you were not farther away from Earth than you were the day before, and so it was not really advancing a space frontier in the way we we dream of such uh, uh, such progress. So when you do that, there are all the. the those advances, which would have to take place among biologists, because we're looking for life on Mars, uh, chemists, physicists, geologists, they'd be planetary geologists in this context, all the, the, the engineering professions, electrical engineers, uh, mechanical engineering, especially aerospace engineering, all of these fields are stoked. And the people active in these fields advancing a frontier, those discoveries invariably mm -hmm. lead to benefits back to society. Those would be the d direct spinoffs. The indirect spinoffs are the, the the nation sees this, they feel it. The the culture of 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 discovery becomes a fundamental part of what it is to be American again. And when that is your culture, your 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 mindset, then you carry it to everything you do. You realize Bill Gates, uh, uh, Steve Jobs, and and Michael Dell were like 12, 13, 14, 15 when we landed on the moon, and it, and they're their contribution is not directly related to space exploration, but it is so innovation. It is that they were in the culture of innovation, and that's exactly how they manifested that that energy and that interest. And they're some of the rich, the wealthiest people in the world, biggest employers in the world. Right, so how do you get? You know, all these presidents and the last two or three presidents have all said, hey, "It's a great idea," you know, but they say it's thirty years away. It's somebody else's job. To do yeah, that's thing. that's the problem. When Kennedy said, "Let's go to the moon." you know, before the decade is out, he had fully expected that we would get there basically under his watch, right, had he served a second term. And that was audacious, given that we didn't even have a vehicle that wouldn't kill us uh, mm -hmm. on the launch pad yet. And so, so that, 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 back then, you, you, a president could make a promise with some expectation of seeing it to, to completion. Today, you know, I, when Obama gave his space speech a couple of years ago, it was quite a rousing speech. You know, well, we don't need to go to the moon. We've been there. Let's go on to Mars and visit the asteroids. And, and that's, it sounded great, and it got applause. And then you pause and say, wait a minute, when is, what kind of timetable is that? Oh, the 2030s. So that's a president to be named later, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where's Obama? Well, he's on the beaches of Hawaii when that's going on, right? And so on a budget not yet established. So I started losing confidence that the way our leaders were establishing these mission statements, that they'd have any chance at all of succeeding. And I realized that the way you succeed something that requires that much money over that much time is to have it embedded in the zeitgeist of the nation. And then we then hold our leaders accountable for those goals rather than one leader or the next using it as a campaign slogan. Do you think you can do that? Well, it's not up to me. It's up to the, the, the it, well, what it is up to are those who understand the return on investment of what we spend on NASA versus what would come back to our culture and to our society. So right now, NASA is a half a penny on the tax dollar. That's all it is. Most people who complain that NASA is getting too much money don't know that. Okay, I've done the experiment. You try it yourself. <laughs> Next time you hear something, we're I, I, too I, much I know, money. But, but all I'm saying is in, back in the 60s, no one talked about, you know, how much it was going to cost. They talked about the zeitgeist. They said, this is what we're, this is a mission. You know, this uh, is our national destiny. That's because it was part of our culture and it was part of our self-identity. But people might say it was a political idea to beat the Russians because of, you know, security in space. Oh, yeah. So that's an, that's an interesting and really important point. We went to the moon not because we're explorers or discoverers or because it's in the DNA. No. Although many people want to remember that era, 
that way. We went to the moon because we were at war with Russia, period. And that famous speech that Kennedy gave mm -hmm. at the joint session of Congress on, on May 1961, we said, we'll put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. We remember that as him as being a visionary, and he, was, uh, he had the charisma, and that's what it took. No. A few paragraphs earlier in that same speech, he says, if the events of recent weeks, because Yuri Gagarin had just come back out of orbit, and Russian, like I said, we didn't even have a vehicle that wouldn't kill us on launch. He said, if the events of recent weeks are any indication of the impact of this adventure, then we need to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. It was a battle cry against communism. It was a war driver. And NASA was founded on this war driver. Sputnik had just been launched. NASA was founded a year later. Everything we did in that era was reactive to what was a perceived threat. Meanwhile... If you pulled aside the fact that we're at war, you look at the glory of the adventure, that was sufficient to stimulate a culture of innovation in a, in a nation that was leading the world in the second half of the 20th century. So, so war is a big driver, but we got the tandem economic benefits from it. So all I'm saying now is, forget the war. Of course, no one wants to go into space for war. That's not a good reason. But when we reflect back on what economic return on investment that can bring, that ought to be a big enough driver mm. as well, as the history of human civilizations demonstrates. Go to more Molehead City, North Carolina. Elizabeth, hi, welcome to Science Friday. Mm. Hi there. Hey. Hey. Go ahead. What inspired him to start writing? Yeah. You, 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 are you interested yourself, Elizabeth? Yes, I'm very interested. I, I'm i a very big fan of science, and I've always loved you. Well, thank you very much. And so this book, I didn't really want to write this book, and I gave a lot of speeches on where I thought NASA should be and our relationship to it. And I realized that uh, while it was very warmly received in the room, nothing ultimately ended up affecting policy or any uh, fundamental changes in how America was conducting its its relationship to space. So then I decided to collect it all together. And so what this book is basically every thought I've ever had about our past, present, and future in space. And it's really a reality check on the delusional thinking that, that is so prevalent where people think they actually understand why things happen or why they don't. And then they blame the wrong thing and then they come up with the wrong solutions. So I put it all together more to uh, now offer it for people uh, to give them a chance to digest it and possibly affect policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, Elizabeth. Yeah. Did you like? Did you like that answer? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a very good answer. All, All right. right. Well, thank you. Thanks mm -hmm. for listening. Have a good weekend. Right. Thanks. Bye bye, um, uh, Neil. You write it in in the book referring to astronauts that quote people need their heroes. Now, uh, who who were yours? Did, did you have role models? Yeah, I think role model is, a, that's for me, that's a whole conversation, by the way. I'll mm -hmm. try to shorten it. For me, role models is an overrated concept because typically when you look for a role model, you're trying to find someone who like looks like you or grew up where you grew up or had the same struggles in life. And if you have ambitions towards a profession for which there's no role model in that as defined that way, then you can't go into that profession. So I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a self-defeating notion that you got to find the person who, like, for example, if I need a, a black astrophysicist from the Bronx to be my role model so that I can be an astrophysicist, I would have never been an astrophysicist. And I realized this very early. So what I did was I, I created, I assembled my role models a la carte. <laughs> so <laughs> I found the, the scientist who I wanted to emulate and the educator and the person who had good moral fiber and the person who had a good sense of humor. And I, I patched all this together to become a, a, a mm -hmm. hybrid role model that I would then use. And in that way, you're not beholden to what might be personality quirks in one person or another. That's why we say, oh, some people, we don't want them to be role models because they're using drugs, even though they're a really great basketball player or novelist or whatever. Well, that's because you your concept of role model means you want to be everything that person is. And that's just, we're all individuals well, but But people are, gonna, are looking at you as a role model. Is someone, if not just... Yeah, not, that doesn't mean I agree with it. I'm just yeah. saying, I think that's, I think role, you should pick your role models a la carte and you'll, you'll stand a much better chance of doing exactly what you want to do in the world without requiring that someone did it before you. Well, in fact, if you only do what people did who came before you, 
nothing would ever change in the world. The people we remember the most are those who did what no one did before them. And that mm -hmm. takes courage and it takes some capacity within you to to navigate places where no one has been before. I'd say that the person the person in my in my lifetime who most exper who most influenced the way people thought about space besides Walt Disney was, you know, uh, were, were people who were very influential was Carl Sagan. Oh, and, indeed. Indeed. He because he was one of the first scientists, maybe even the first scientist to exploit the value of mass media in, the in, in serving the interest of the advance of science, knowing that science, at least in America, is, a ta is primarily a tax-base funded enterprise. And so you have the right, to, as a taxpayer, to learn what are the scientists doing in the lab and in the telescopes and in the, you know, that you, it's an obligation. Not only do you have the right to know, it's our obligation to tell you. And he took that to, to extremes never se before seen. Was he one of the elements of your role model? No, because well, in a, in a, in, a, in a way, but I I first met him when I was seventeen, and I was I was I knew I wanted to do astrophysics since age nine, nine, mm -hmm. ten, eleven. So I saw that he was out there, and I thought it was great. But uh, the, the the way in which he influenced me most was when I met him at his office at Cornell. I was still in high school, and I had just been admitted to Cornell, but I was still deciding what school to go to because I, I had several choices. But unbeknownst to me, the admissions office sent him my application, which was dripping with the universe, of course. And he sent me a personal letter inviting me to Cornell and to see his lab to help me decide whether or not I would choose Cornell as a school. Mm -hmm. And I went up there. I, I followed through on it. He met me outside on a Saturday. It was snowing. We, I went toward the lab, toward part of the campus, and I'm ready to go back to New York. It, it begins to snow a little heavier. He, he takes me to the bus station because I'd come up on a bus from New York City. And he said, if, it, if the bus can't get through, here's my phone number. Call me. You can spend the night if you can't get through. It was like, who am I for him to treat me this way? He'd already been on The Tonight Show. He was already famous. Not It was before Cosmos. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, he was already famous. And I said to myself, if I am ever remotely this visible and this famous when I am a, a, an adult, I will surely give the attention to students that come my way that he has given to me. And it benchmarked marked how I think about how I spend my time. It, you know, the president of my institution or the White House could call me. I said, you got to wait because I've got a student sitting here that I'm talking to. That's the extent to which I have prioritized that well, mission. And that, I, I credit that to Carl Sagan. That is certainly a role model. And is is that uh, the reason why well, you— Well, that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the a la carte part yeah. of the role model. Well, that I, I mean, that's, you could mm -hmm. have different reasons why somebody sure. is your role model. Uh -huh. uh, but it, if that, by that measure, I have 12 role models. Yeah, well, okay. but, but <laughs> is, is that the reason why you're going to be doing the new version of Cosmos? <laughs> uh, I don't—I uh, uh, don't, I think most reasons for most things are more complex yes. than just saying that's the reason. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that I—, I I've, I've become quite visible over the past couple of years, in part because I'm based in New York City and, and all the major news gathering headquarters and you yourself, your studios are right there, an easy date uh, for me to come to the studio or for you to come up. And I hand you some sound bites and, and they put it on the evening news. And so I'm happy to serve the public appetite for the universe. I'm also happy to report that about 85% of those media encounters are because a producer saw some news story that the universe flinched and they wanted to comment. Only about 15% are created because of the marketing of some product. Like in this case, this, this is because there's, someone, there's a book that mm -hmm. I just wrote. And so the publisher wants to maximize that exposure. That's 15% of it. The rest is a genuine interest that the public has. And so given my early intersection with Carl and my present visibility, I feel almost duty-bound to serve the role as the host of the this reboot of uh, of Cosmos, which uh, we're currently engaged in, as uh, as perhaps many of your listeners already know. And when when can we look forward to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's still we're still scripting, and uh, probably no sooner than fall of next year, more likely uh, spring of 2014. So it's a while. You look you would look good in a turtleneck <laughs> and a corduroy jacket. <laughs> I'm still yeah. working on my billions. <laughs> no, I'm going to try to find something where I can say it's trillions and trillions. <laughs> yeah, <my laughs> because we got 
to keep moving forward here, you know. Right. 1-800-989-8255. Talking with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, author of Space Chronicles, Facing uh, the Ultimate Frontier. A lot of people would uh, like to know about uh, what's going on. Let's go to Steve in Chicago. Hi, Steve. Hi. How are you? Hi there. Go ahead. Excellent. Thank you very much for the program, Ira. I love the opportunity and the thoughts that it provokes. Um, my question, comment, is I'm a child of the 50s, uh, baby boomer. Um, I've lived um, through an incredible age. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, some of the families on the street had a television. Some of them had a, a phone. You know, it was a party line. We have the space race. We have spinoffs that have obviously uh, affected our, our lives uh, for the better. Um, DARPA turned into the Internet. I can't, I can't comprehend even how to talk about the changes that the Internet has, has you know, um, created uh, opportunities. Um, we go into space, yes, we should allocate some resources to continuing our space exploration, but um, it looks as though the history, uh, the, the latter half of the last century, um, there are problems here on Earth that were ignored, and I think, you know, our resources would be far better uh, spent um, improving our quality of life here, um, while at the same time we continue to, you know, push the space frontier forward. Uh, but this is the only planet we have right now, and it's going to be a while before we can get to another one. We need to concentrate uh, our efforts here at home. Uh, All right, so that's a common sentiment, and... and it's and it's an easy to understand sentiment except it's 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 not properly motivated by how we're actually spending money for example uh, the people say why why are we spending money up there we have problems down here on earth so let's tackle social problems for the moment let's ask the budget how much budget budget how much do you spend on social programs and on education that turns out when you when you add it up it's 50 times what we spend on nasa right now 50 exactly. times. And so so we are concerned about what's going on here on Earth. We are trying to solve those problems. So for someone to suggest, I'm not saying you said this, but it, in, the, in the spirit of what you said, one might suggest zero NASA's budget and give that money to the social programs. That would increase the social program budget by 2%. And is, no, going to no, believe that, 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 that wouldn't solve the problem. No, no that would not solve the It, it would not solve the problem. Spending. On, it, on social programs is not there. The effectiveness of the spending in the space race and, and uh, you know, what budget allocations were given before, um, those have had very positive spinoffs. Um, right, so, right. There's, so I'm there's just... There's a greater payback ratio. Right, right. And so, uh, well, we're talking about uh, payback ratios, that's it. Uh, something about, now, if we talk about not social programs, but the environment and just Earth protecting it for our own survival, uh, consider, of course, that... Mars once had liquid running water coursing over its surface, and today it's bone dry. Something bad happened on Mars. Some knob turned on Mars. I want to know what that knob is, because we could be turning just one of those knobs here on Earth. Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect. It's 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Some other knob got turned there. I, I want to understand what's going on in the rest of the universe, because I gain insight to what's happening here on Earth. You, and so, yeah, go on. I was just going to say, do, do you think in this political year you might turn this into a question? Of I, I, I think it should, first, it shouldn't be a question. It should be an obvious, blunt, yeah, of course, we're going to invest in NASA because not only do we get those spinoffs. By the way, NASA was the primary instigator of the miniaturization of electronics at the beginning of the electronics um, revolution. The, 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 the microelectronics revolution. You know, when we went back when our grandparents had radios as furniture in their living room, no one actually had the thought, gee, one day I want to carry that around in my pocket. It was just not even a thought. NASA says we need to put electronics on space probes and every ounce that it weighs cost us in fuel, so I want to make it as light as possible and as small as possible. That launched an entire movement that then became self-sustaining in the electronics marketplace, mm -hmm. for sure. But the thought to do that and the valuation of what that means was birthed at NASA. So my bigger issue here is that the culture of innovation is what is triggered by NASA. And there's another, let's go back to the environment for a moment. Consider that when we went to the moon, with the object of, of studying the moon, at least in part, 
it would be the last mission to the moon that actually had a geologist on it, not the first. But <laughs> that's another conversation. So you go to the moon, and uh, Apollo 8 was the first to do this. You look back, and you see Earth suspended there in the void of space. That was a photo taken in 1968 by Apollo 8 when they did their figure eight around the moon. Mm -hmm. Do you realize that between 1968 and 1972 and 73, this is when, these are all the missions where we went to the moon and landed, and, and, and a little bit after that, are the primary legislation in America to protect the Earth. The Environmental Protection Agency was in that period. The uh, major uh, adjustment, major improvements to the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the banning of DDT, all of this happened in that period. Earth Day started. Um, you know the organization Doctors Without Borders? That started in 1970. Where do you even get the phrase without borders? That didn't really have currency in our language until we mm -hmm. saw Earth in space from the moon, not drawn by map makers with countries colored in, but drawn by nature itself huh. with land, water, air. This is Science Friday from NPR. I'm Ira Flato talking with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, author of Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate uh, Frontier. And, and so you're saying that we had the culture, and that culture spurred other things that we, we had no way of even predicting what would come out of it. That's correct. And so that is what happens when you innovate. When you innovate, th new, new ideas, new products, new ways of thinking arrive in your lap. And then you, if you exploit that, if you're in a free market enterprise, you can exploit it for financial gain, for cultural gain, for emotional gain, for spiritual gain. So by my read of history, I trace the, 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 modern, the modern environmental movement to those years mm -hmm. that we went to the moon. I, I hear you. Uh, is it possible, but the spur, as, we, as you said before, the spur was a political military race. Is it possible to use that again to get us going because I can't see how we can get that like Sisyphus pushing that thing up and down a hill how we can get it rolling downhill could we say that China has already said they're going to the to the moon and other places as as political leverage okay so so oh, oh by the way just real quick uh, I, I I compile this list I just wanted to mm -hmm. so the cl ma major revisions to the Clean Air Act occurred in 1970 the uh, the first Earth Day was 1970 in San Francisco. The first National Earth Day was in Washington. Uh, uh, both of those 1970. EPA was established in 1970. The Hellstrom Chronicle, remember that movie, sure. the documentary about that was 1971. Doctors Without Borders, founded in 1971. DDT ban 1972. The Whole Earth Catalog was published between 1968 and 1972. Comprehensive Endangered Species Act was 1973. The catalytic converter for, for cars was put into play in 1973. That, that how did that happen? What, 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 what? All in just those years, the same years we are walking on the moon, looking back to Earth. Earth became a precious place to preserve after we went to the moon, because going to the moon enabled us to learn about Earth for the first time. All right, I'm talking with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History and author of Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. We're gonna take a little desktop diary tour of his desk in just a few minutes with Flora, who's here with us in the studio. But before we do that, uh, um, you talk about pie in the sky stuff to a lot of people, but some of these things are really even more down to earth issues like uh, talking in your book about the possibility of an asteroid crashing into earth and we still can't do we still can't do anything about that or we're not motivated or moved or whatever. Yeah, I was that was my big guns. I was saving that for last. You know, if you still didn't agree with me. No, I was no. Say, this is the time to wheel out the gun. <laughs> no, if if you if there was still a lingering doubt, uh, there's we know there are asteroids out there whose orbit crossed that of Earth. And the catalog now is in the tens of thousands. Uh, most are small, some some are large, and uh, we want to track them as accurately as possible so that we can predict in the future if one of them is actually going to hit. We're going to have some near misses coming up, one in 2029 on April 13th, the asteroid Apophis. It's the size of the Rose Bowl. It'll come close as if the Rose Bowl were an egg cup and you placed it in, in the full bowl of the mm -hmm. stadium. That's the size of the asteroid. It will come closer to Earth than our orbiting communication satellites. It'll be the closest, biggest thing we've ever seen in 
in the history of our capacity to know these things. And there's another one slated for 2040, but we need better data on that before we should start freaking out. But I don't want to go extinct from an asteroid when we had a space program that could have done something about it. That would just be embarrassing. <laughs> I don't want to be the laughing stock of aliens in the galaxy <laughs> when they find out we went extinct with a space program sitting there and did nothing about it. When we knew the dinosaurs, if they had a space program, they surely would have deflected their asteroid that rendered them extinct. But you can't get anybody. I mean, you know, how do you get some? I, I'm looking to find a way that you can get people excited about. I'll tell you how. How, I'll how tell do you get people excited? I'll tell you how. Uh, uh, it's a long story, and I don't have time to explain it. But I wrote a long, I wrote a, a chapter in a book called "The Columbia History of the 20th Century" back in the late 1990s. And so, in there, I wanted to say, you know, I want to go to Mars, and but that's going to be really expensive. Right. Let Let me look at the history of major funded projects throughout culture and throughout time, and see what drivers worked for them. And I make a whole book of all these drivers, and you have charts, and you just cross-reference. Mm -hmm. You say, let's do this because it worked then, right? And uh, uh, to my surprise, I found only three drivers of major funded projects in the history of our species. The number one among them is war, the I don't want to die driver. And that's responsible for, for the, um, the Great Wall of China, the Manhattan Project, the Apollo Project. When war is when you might die... Water flows like rivers, like or tapped keg, whatever's your preference mm -hmm. there. Another driver is, of course, economic return, the promise of economic return. And that, that's what drove the Columbus voyages and the Magellan voyages. And, and, you know, Columbus himself was a discoverer, no doubt about it. But the people who wrote the check were not. That was Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, and they say, Columbus, here, here's, here's a satchel full of Spanish flags. Put them wherever you land, and claim this, claim that in the name of, of Spain, and th this was, and tell us what riches there are there for us to exploit. That's essentially mm -hmm. the backstory of that mission, and so, so the promise of economic game is a huge driver in the history of the world. And third is is the praise of gods and, and royalty. So you get the pyramids and the cathedrals of Europe and in uh, in in the UK and and so that's a major enterprise a major investment in human and financial capital to achieve some collective goal that the society values so i'm saying i don't want to go into space for war even though we did that in the 60s yeah. the benefit was the economic return so I'm saying shed the war baggage, do it for the economic return, then you're not going to complain what mm -hmm. it costs because all that matters is your return on that investment. Mm -hmm. But look but look how laughed at Newt Gingrich was when he suggested that we build a colony on the moon. Now, whatever your political stripe, you could at least use it as a starting point to I talk about it. I didn't laugh at him. In, in fact, uh, the, the media coverage is so polarized that they didn't quite know how to interpret my comments. I was on MSNBC reacting to, they, wanted, they pulled me in, and I said, well, you know, people say he's, he's crazy. What, what kind of, he's too, too ambitious or too, you know, since we've already been to the moon, to say let's build a colony there in eight years is less ambitious than Kennedy in 1961 saying let's walk on the moon in eight years, even though we, at, because at that time we hadn't even have a, a spacecraft to take us anywhere. So, but you want to compare, Kennedy's was more audacious than Gingrich. The people who criticize Gingrich are the people who just don't like Gingrich. So they don't like anything he says. Mm -hmm. And they even juxtapose his comically presented comment that um, in this colony we'll put 13,000 Americans and have them petition for statehood. That was, that was hilarious, actually. But that was not spoken in the same part of his speech where he wanted to put the colony on the moon. So no, that's not completely crazy. At the end of this, the conservative press said Tyson sympathizes with Gingrich's plan. And the liberal press said Tyson shoots down Gingrich's Gingrich's moon proposal. So that that told me I must have do, been doing the right thing. <laughs> uh, but you do agree we should go to the moon first as a stepping stone to go back to Mars? No, I think uh, yes, but I'd rather phrase that whole statement differently. Please. What I want is to turn the solar system, especially the near solar system, into our backyard. And if it becomes your backyard, you then have a suite of launch vehicles that you design and build, and you strap on one kind of booster configuration or another that'll take you to the moon if that's where you so choose, take you to Mars if that's what's necessary, take you to an, 
asteroid when it's time to deflect it, take you to some space station if there's a geopolitical reason to do so, take you to the backside of the moon if you want to be a tourist, make, the, make space an adv ever-advancing frontier so that every new step we take innovates, and it's not just do we go here or there, I want to go everywhere. And so the attitude is, space is our backyard. When you were a kid, you put out in the backyard, and if it's the city, then the m metaphorical backyard, you didn't want to be restricted to where you want to go. You want to let your curiosity take you wherever it might, uh, wherever it, it pulls. So, so no, I, and, and any space enthusiast was not critical of, of, of Gingrich for those mm -hmm. comments. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like getting on a plane. I can take it wherever I want it to go. Yes, and when we built the, the, the Eisenhower interstate system, you don't say, we will build one road from New York to Los Angeles, and that will be our country. No, you build roads everywhere, and people, I like the mountains, you like the valleys. Somebody else likes uh, salt lakes, you know? Other mm -hmm. people like... Um, uh, 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 the Great Lakes and, right. and be beaches. So then people can express their own creativity and their own freedoms because I'd like to keep telling ourselves that we live in a free country. Mm -hmm. And so, so once you engage in that kind of enterprise, oh, oh by the way, the, uh, with regard to Gingrich, like I said, the country is just polarized. They just, they, just, they just want to argue no matter what comes up without actually thinking it through. There is a place to land in the middle that's not a compromise. It's just a really good idea that transcends politics. It's not even bipartisan. It's nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. It's a nonpartisan idea. What a concept. All right? Where everyone says, hey, let's just do that. Yeah. 1-800-989-8255 is our number. Joining us now is uh, Flora Lichtman, a multimedia editor who visited your office, did she not? Uh, and she was welcomed very well. I could tell from the video that she brought back. Yes, very <laughs> graciously. Hi, Dr. Tyson. Hello. <laughs> yes, so Dr. Tyson, let us in. Let us rummage through his desk drawers almost. Um, well, I have to say, you were not the first people I let tour my office. I noticed, I actually. I, I, I felt want... a little hurt today. No, I no, it's, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're like the third camera crew to, to say, what? It's, it's got some good stuff for me. So, But I, I, I just want in disclosure. I but no one does it better than Flora. So. Thank okay. you, Ira. We did uncover some things that I think not everyone got. For example, if this isn't a reason to go to our website right now, I don't know what is. We saw a picture of you in a unitard from your wrestling days. But I thought you didn't photograph that, though, did you? Oh, yes. It's up there. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> be, be, be afraid. Surprise. Be very afraid. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, uh, in the wrestling circles, they're not called unitards. They're called singlets. Okay. Oh, well, good to know. Singlets, yeah. singlet it is. It's a, it is a singlet, yeah. But that was back when I was buff. Now I'm like chubby and <laughs> 54 and... You know, just waiting to sit on the couch and watch so, TV. So Flora has exclusive footage of you. <laughs> no, Apparently, that's unwittingly. I'm sorry. It, it, no, no, that's right. It's exclusive footage then, if you actually pick that up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what else did we see? We saw a few of kind of amazing things. Like you made this desk lamp when you were just 12 that was yeah. space-themed. What Will you tell us that story? It's so Yeah, charming. yeah. I was in shop class, as it, people are, you know. In fact, by the way, I'm so old that back then only the boys took shop class. And remember the girls that, were, in, were in the cooking. Remember that know. Bill Cosby routine he used to talk about <laughs> so so me and the boys right are, mm -hmm. are just making stuff right and one of the le plans was to make a lamp and they already had these pre-existing plans that were pretty easy and straightforward and tested some key principles that you learn i said no no i'm not doing some pre-existing plan i like saturn and i want to design a lamp after saturn and so after some hemming and hawing, they allowed me to do it. I glued together blocks, lathed a sphere out of these, <laughs> this cube of blocks, cut a, a wooden ring, and the wooden ring now, and you drill a hole through the sphere, put the, the cord up through, and now I have a Saturn lamp with a base. And so the way it works is you press down the ring. The ring pivots. You press it down and the light turns on and off. And I've had it, it it's been my official desk lamp since middle school, and I still have it. Uh, in my office at the Hayden Planetarium. Oh, it's really adorable. I mean, one... oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I no like one's it. ever called anything I've done adorable. That's so cute. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I wanted to ask you that this came up in our interview when we we did this video. But even though you knew from such a young age that you were interested in space and you were so passionate about it, even giving lectures in your teens, you. It sounds like you got some pushback that not everyone encouraged you to go in this direction. Oh yeah. Well, first of all, 
my, my story is not unique among those who want to achieve in ways that people don't expect. And then everyone says, oh, you'll never make it, or why bother? This is easier. Do that. Uh, so my story about people telling me what I should or shouldn't do is not unique. Uh, but, but since you've asked, I can, I can tell you that uh, at no time was there an adult other than my parents who sort of invested in my interests. Uh, they took me around to, to, to buy the, 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 the lens for the telescope or the tripod or, or there, there's some exotic conjunction of planets and moons that existed and can be visible from only one location. They would drive me there. So they were supportive of my interests. But outside of that, uh, so it was clear that society was not ready for me to become an astrophysicist. Because uh, 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 first in the street, it's important that you're athletic, right? Otherwise, you can't hang out. So I was pretty athletic, but I knew that was not my primary interest. But anybody who saw my athletics, but then heard me say, I want to be an astrophysicist, they said, oh, no, 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 you should just play basketball. That's where you really should be. And just saying this as though this is in my own best interest and uh, thinking that they're doing me a favor by suggesting this. So it was clear that there were pre-existing stereotypes that people, not in any overt sort of racist way, but just, just how they saw life. They could not see life with me as an astrophysicist, only doing things where others of my skin color had done before. And that was throughout my life, up through probably my late 20s, early 30s. So how did you not get discouraged? I mean, how did you muster the ego to keep pushing on? Yeah, it's not ego. It's more metal than ego. Uh, I was... Uh, <laughs> we're going to have a vocabulary <laughs> lesson here. That's uh -oh. what we'll, we'll do. So uh, I had really deep fuel reserves I had, I had fuel reserves down in places they couldn't have imagined. So every time there was a naysayer that, that, that consumed some of my, some of my energy capital, as, you, as it were, I would reach into the reserves and pull out more. And the reserves got low, really low a few times. And uh, up into college, uh, there were a couple of times where it's like, whoa, I don't know if I can keep this up. And you know, the last few drops, and I'd get over that hump and then continue. But I, I, st I stuck with it, and I'm, I'm glad that I had, because now, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in the happiest person in the world. And as Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And, and so I love sharing the cosmic love. Mm -hmm. This is Science Friday from NPR. I'm Ira Plato with Flora Lichtman, talking with Neil deGrasse Tyson, author of Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. Uh, Neil, if you were put in charge... Of all of our space efforts, would you take the job? Uh, no, because the person in charge of the space efforts reports to the president. And right now, the president's plan is not the plan that I think is in our best interest. It requires vastly more money than anyone is allocating. And the argument they're giving is we can't afford it right now, when the real answer is we can't afford to not do it. So the only way to actually affect this change is to convince the public of why it's good for them and good for their economy. By the way, when you innovate, you create innovative things in your marketplace and the jobs can't go overseas because they haven't figured out how to do it yet. One of the symptoms of an absence of innovation is the fact that you lose your jobs. Everyone else catches up with you and they can do what you do better than you or cheaper than you. And in a multinational corporate uh, free market enterprise, the, it is their company's obligation to take the factory to a place where they can make it more cheaply. But in the 60s and 70s, did, was anyone complaining that jobs were going overseas? I, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. Because we were innovating in ways that the rest of the world was playing catch up. And so I, uh, so that for me, the motivation is to compel the nation to want to do this so that so that we, so to, as, as a stoking force on our economy, and that and, and, and once the nation wants to do it, the pressure then gets put on our lawmakers, and then what they end up putting into place is the expression of our wishes, not some political or whim that, that happens to be make a good campaign slogan. Hmm. So you don't think talking to President Obama, for example, would help any? Well, okay, it turns out because of all of the attention this book has garnered this week in the media, you're like Friday, right? But it's been going on since since Monday. And but I was looking forward to you the most, Ira. I just want you to know. <laughs> good, good recovery. <laughs> <laughs> Shoo! I said, where was I going on that one? Okay. So, uh, but it turns out I got a phone call from the Senate, and they want me to testify in front of the Senate House Committee uh, on, I mean, the, the Senate Committee on Commerce next Wednesday. 
and I'll be testifying after the head of NASA to comment on where I think the future of NASA should be in its relationship to the nation. So uh, I, that's a that's bittersweet for me because personally, I don't like trying to influence politicians who are themselves representatives of huge numbers of people. I, as an educator, I'd rather I'd rather enlighten the people and educate the people and let they be the ones who put the pressure mm-hmm. on their elected officials. I feel like I'm I'm circumventing. The, 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 the electoral process right. by speaking directly to senators. But if, if it's just a matter of cluing them in to what my thoughts are, I'm happy to do that, and well, I've been invited to do so. Good luck to you. And, thank, thank you. And, and thank good you. luck with the book, as always. Neil deGrasse Tyson, author of Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. He's also astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History here in New York.